Okay, uh, so let's continue talking about our, uh, res our reactions with alkenes and alkynes and details of those. Um, if you remember from uh, last time, we talked about polymerization reactions with free radical chemistry. Um, what I would expect you to be able to do is be able to look at the structure of a polymer and get some idea about what the repeating unit is and be able to identify what alkene uh, might have made that polymer um, or vice versa, what the polymer structure might look like from an alkene. Um, so if you become familiar with that and understanding how that the starting precursor, the alkenes, and the structure of the polymer are related. Uh, about free radical mechanisms in general, there are three basic steps uh, that are common in all free radical chain reactions, whether it's polymerization or something else. That's some reaction which generates reactive free radicals from, from uh, something we, where we didn't have them before. So that's an initiation step. Any reaction of a free radical with something else that generates a product that also has reactive free radicals is a reaction which continues the chain reaction because you still have something reactive on the right side of the equation. So that's a propagation step. And any combination of, of radicals uh, that terminate a reaction by not generating another reactive radical is a termination step. So if you have that broad idea of those definitions and what that looks like in a, in a radical reaction, that's what you should also take away from that. Okay? Um, we're talking about conjugation. Uh, remember, conjugation is a situation when we have double bonds at pi systems, actually pi bonds, that are adjacent to each other across more than just two carbons. So when you have double bonds consecutively with single bonds in between, um, and you examine each carbon along that chain of those double bonds, the carbons all are sp2 hybridized continuously. And because of that, they can all be lined up together in one orientation, uh, in which case the electrons actually are not just localized in one specific bond, all the electrons of these double bonds are delocalized throughout. Okay? This is something that we, we don't really go into uh, the theory of the calculations of the orbitals. We focus mostly on uh, valence and, and atomic orbitals, but in, in another theory for describing structure are molecular orbitals, orbitals that exist over the whole molecule. And pi systems are very nicely described by that. So if you're interested in learning more about that, uh, take a look at some <laughs> molecular orbitals. But the point is that <clears throat> the communication between the pi bonds, there, there is certainly interaction along the whole conjugated system, and that has impacts in chemistry. So if you have something like two double bonds in a row, and you react with an electrophile with the kinds of reactions that we've been talking about for the last couple of weeks, <clears throat> this can have outcomes in the reactions in different ways. So it's not just reacting on one isolated double bond, but the conjugated double bond system in total. Okay, so you have to have some idea about uh, what the intermediates are in these reactions and how that's impacted. So, in the case of HBr or Br2 adding to a diene system, which is conjugated, all of those, those double bonds are all right in a row, there are two possible products. Okay? And various ratios, that depends a lot on specifics of the specific reactants to the actual ratios. But we see two products that are hard to explain by just reacting with a single double bond. Right? Uh, by the way, your homework and the book refers to these two different products. These are regioisomers, um, constitutional isomers of uh, the bromobutene. Uh, we refer to these as the 1-2 addition product or the 1-4 addition product. That's referring to, not, and it's not necessarily related to the number of the chain when you name it, but the relationship of your conjugated system, whether that's embedded in a larger molecule or simply in uh, butadiene here, um, there's, there's always one end of this diene and the other. So if you just think about the diene system and thinking about the distance, right? It's a four carbon unit. And so if the groups that you're adding add on the first and second carbon, that's the one, two product. And if the groups you added added to the one and four carbons, 
across the diene. That's the one four product. Okay. What characterizes the one four product is that the double bond has actually moved from where it was in the original molecule, the way we've drawn it here. The double bond is from one to two and then three to four. In this product, the double bond has moved in between, so it's actually between two and three. Okay. That's another way to look for that one, two, or one, four product. Well, the reason that um, these two different products result in these reactions, again, is because conjugation, and conjugation not just of the two double bonds, but when you make the intermediate carbocation, that carbocation is also conjugated with another double bond. So if I, if I can, uh, if you think about this reacting to take the hydrogen from HBr to H plus, right, what does that form? That forms the molecule where the hydrogen is added there, leaving the carbon from the other side of that double bond with a plus charge, right? Empty. And if we think about this in terms of the orbitals, I'm just going to draw the carbons in a row here. Okay. We've added the hydrogen to this end, so I'll just I'll just highlight that CH3 group on the end now. I'm going to skip writing the other hydrogens for clarity. Uh, but just to show you that if we think about that structure of the pi bond here, right? Here's the pi bond with two electrons in it. And then the plus charge is an empty orbital. P orbital. So you can see that plus charge also is adjacent to, directly adjacent to a carbon that has sp2 hybridization, the orbital. Right? So these electrons that are in this double bond, okay, they're not just localized in that double bond, um, they're actually spread out throughout. And if we draw these as resonance forms, I'll get back to resonance forms in a minute, where I can easily draw this another way. Okay, let me just draw the same thing. There's a p orbital on every carbon of that three carbon unit, right? But now if I draw, just draw it with localized electrons, the electrons are there and the plus charges over on the end. Okay. These are essentially the same. The only thing we've done is taken a whole pi system and just shown like a frozen moment where two electrons might be over here or over there. Uh, in actuality, let me change color, it might help with clarity. In actuality, that plus charge is distributed and the electrons are distributed throughout all three of those p orbitals. Okay? And that's why we can get products where uh, the bromide could have added to the number two carbon to give this product. The one two product. Or the bromide could have added to the other end of the double bond. Notice that the electrons would be in the middle to give the one four product. Okay. You see how this uh, idea of understanding that what we draw in Lewis structures up here in the carbocation for this one and this one. <coughs> Neither exists, they're representing extremes. We can use them to predict where things show up and where charge is, but the actual structure of this intermediate is something in between. Okay? So that brings us back to the idea of resonance. And when we're talking specifically about these three carbon groups, okay, the three carbon groups where we have a double bond next to something else, uh, we see delocalization of electrons and charges uh, spread out on p orbitals, whether it's a plus charge, oops, I keep doing that, whether it's a plus charge, whether it's a free radical, or whether it's a, a pair of electrons or a negative charge. Okay, each of those we can draw another form showing that spreading out of all the electrons and charges in the system. Okay, the specific Lewis structures on either end that describe it tell us where actually the charges are, are, are more prominent. So for an allyl cation, the plus charge is here on the end carbon, right? In that particular form that we've drawn. If I 
move those electrons over to, to move the double bond to the plus charge, that leaves the other end empty. The resonance form for that would show the plus charge over on that carbon. So that way you see if you're going to add bromide to an allyl cation, you're not going to add it to the middle carbon because none of the resonance forms that we could draw to represent extremes of the structure of this intermediate would have plus charge on the middle carbon. They're only on the end carbons. Okay. We can do the same thing with a radical, in which case we just shift one electron over to draw the resonance form. Notice my two-headed arrow for resonance form, where the free radical is on both ends, not the middle carbon. Same thing with the negative charge. We can shift those electrons here and push it up onto the carbon and put the negative charge over there. All right. Um, I've had a, uh, a lot of people ask me, and a question came up in the last class, uh, about how do you know where charges are on various atoms? And, uh, and that's something we call formal charge, which you should have learned in general chemistry. I'm going to review that just a, in just a minute. But because it's really important to understand what the charges are on atoms and how those, where electrons are, changes that. So in terms of resonance forms for various molecules, uh, again, we're trying to represent Lewis structures that are not an actual structure of what's something in between that's hard to, uh, to make for by accounting. Accounting. Electrons. Where are electrons? Well, they're spread out. The problem is they're not just on one place. Uh, so they don't exist. Something in between exists. Uh, and we only, uh, what characterizes the rest of this form is it's, uh, it's the representation of something where we have not broken actually bonds between, our, between atoms. We haven't moved atoms. We've only moved electrons within a pi system. It has to be along p orbitals only. If you have to change sigma bonds, single bonds, then that's not a resonance form. You've actually changed the structure from one to the other. Those would actually be uh, some kind of other reaction. All of them have to obey normal valency rules. You can, you can certainly imagine drawing resonance forms uh, but with multiple bonds and things, but they could be wrong if you're putting 10 electrons around an atom, so be careful about that. Uh, it's possible to have sometimes less electrons, like a carbocation only has six, uh, but you can't have more. Um, and what actually exists, obviously, is more stable than either of the resonance forms. But the resonance forms themselves the extremes of the resonance forms don't have to be equal in energy. Like the allyl cation, they're identical in terms of, of energy. They don't have to be if it's not symmetric. Okay, so I just want to review, uh, take a, a few minutes and make sure you're up to speed on what, what I mean when I say formal charge, because I've, I've uh, used that term uh, a number of times in class and I've been met with some blank stares sometimes on that. So, when we when we've constructed molecules and Lewis structures from the atoms on that uh, second row of the periodic table with carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, halogens, and even we've talked about boron, for example, we know intuitively now because we've been working with it enough. Carbon has four bonds, oxygen has two bonds, halogens have one bond, nitrogen has three bonds, right? Those are the stable structures of molecules with those atoms uh, where they haven't gained or lost any electrons uh, or any electron ownership. Okay? Once we start using their lone pairs or, or taking away electrons or adding electrons by increasing or decreasing the number of bonds that it normally has, then there must be some charge. There must be some form, what we call a formal charge, whether it's plus or minus. And the more you work with it, the more you'll get to understand uh, and see that easier. Um, so the charge is not zero if they have more or less bonds than their valency requires. And so we use formal charges to keep track of that. Uh, and so one way to easily calculate that, formal charge is equal to the number of valence electrons that atom has minus the number of bonds. Or, in other words, it's only one electron from each of the covalent bonds it has, 
minus the number of non-bonded electrons or lone pairs. Okay, so how does this work? Well, let's take a look at some examples. Um, this molecule, I've drawn the Lewis structure for nitric acid. Okay, but you notice that there are not, there are some atoms that don't have the right number of bonds for their valency. We should be able to calculate the uh, formal charges associated with this molecule. Okay, the various atoms. So let's take a look at this. Uh, first of all, let's look at the nitrogen in the middle. How many valence electrons does nitrogen start with? Nitrogen has three bonds, and it actually has five valence electrons, right? So the nitrogen here has five valence electrons, okay? But it has now four bonds to it. So with four bonds, okay, it one of those electrons in each of those bonds is owned by, quote, owned by the nitrogen. So we subtract four, and then how many non-bonded electrons does it have? In this case, if it has four bonds, it has zero. So overall, that equals plus one. Nitrogen has a plus charge, a plus one formal charge. Okay, so that's not a neutral nitrogen. Localized in this molecule, the nitrogen is positively charged. So you'll see me often draw a plus next to it. Okay, how about this oxygen on the top? Number of valence electrons? Six. How many bonds? Two. two. How many lone electrons? Two. They're two lone pairs, four electrons. So that's six minus six, that's zero. That's that's perfectly fine. And you should immediately recognize oxygen's valency is two, it has two bonds and two lone pairs, then it should be zero. Hopefully you recognize that. But this oxygen on the bottom is a little different. It doesn't have the right number of bonds for its valency. So there must be some kind of charge. Okay? So again, uh, uh, valence electron six minus one bond to it, minus six non-bonding electrons, that is minus one. Okay, so the formal charge for that oxygen is minus one. We draw a minus five. So you should be able to do this uh, and hopefully recognize this uh, easily when we look at different kinds of molecules where we are shifting around. This is really important when we talk about resonance because we need to understand the charges so we don't count extra lone pairs or things on those atoms. All right? So ammonium on the top. There's another example. Nitrogen has four bonds, no lone pairs, I hope you immediately recognize that this should be plus charge, that nitrogen has a plus charge. So this is an ion, it's an ammonium ion. Right? Ammonium chloride would be NH4Cl. It's this ammonium ion with an ionic bond to a Cl minus. Okay. We've seen boron trifluoride, right? Here's boron tetrafluoride. So what's the formal charge for the boron here? Negative one, that's right. So actually this boron with four bonds to it has a minus charge. So look at the periodic table. Boron with four bonds, minus charge. Carbon with four bonds, zero. Nitrogen with four bonds, plus one. Okay, oxygen, if you could get four bonds on it, which we don't see that would be plus two, uh, usually it's the other way around. So this is a minus one, so again, if you want to do it, um, boron has three valence electrons minus four bonds minus zero lone pairs would be minus one. Okay. So uh, that's all the time I want to spend on formal charge. But it, is, it is important, I think, when we talk about resonance that you understand uh, where these charges come from and uh, how to figure that out. 
Okay, so back to resonance. I mentioned the resonance forms of the uh, molecules we're interested in, whether they're intermediates or, or not intermediates in a reaction. Represent the extremes, and what exists is actually something in between. So alkyne has two resonance forms, uh, but the actual structure is, in this case, a symmetric structure, where on either end of the allyl is the plus charge, there's positive character, or some amount of electron deficiency, uh, and that's where reactions might happen, like bromide adding. And the middle carbon, there's no plus charge. But so that's symmetric. If it's substituted in a different way, like we've added a group now onto the end of the three carbon unit, that would be the allylic cation. Okay, there's the same three carbons that we have conjugation with of the plus charge and the double bond. Notice those three carbons are not equal in electron distribution. So what that means is in the spectrum along all the possible places from the left to the right where the actual structure lies, it's not exactly in the middle because one is more stable than the other. Okay? And you should be able to take a look at the resonance forms that we've drawn on the top and tell me which one would you expect to be lower in energy. Yeah, the one on the right, because the one on the right, if we were to, if we had that Lewis structure, the carbocation is more substituted. It's a secondary versus a primary carbocation. So yeah, this one is lower in energy on the right, so it's more stable. So the actual structure, which is represented here in this electrostatic diagram, uh, is somewhere closer to the right-sided structure than the left. Not all the way to the right, that one doesn't exist. It's somewhere in between, but closer to the right. And you can see that if you calcul calculate the electron density, there's more blue or more plus charge on the middle carbon. Okay? That can impact reactivity as well when we're doing a reaction with this. Just knowing where the charges are. Okay, so far we've shown Examples that have just one other resonance form. So we have two extremes and we have something in between. Uh, we talked about acetate some time ago. This is the acetate anion on the top. And this has resonance forms as well. And I'm going to draw in the electrons just to make sure you have a complete picture of the Lewis structure. Notice minus one charge on the oxygen, minus one formal charge. If you want to draw the other resonance form, okay, how do you imagine those electrons uh, moving from one from the structure that's drawn to the new resonance form? Can you switch where it goes on the oxygen? It's like the double bond, the two electrons. Electrons from the double bond will go up to the oxygen. Exactly. In this case, this is like the opposite of the allyl cation we just talked about, where I showed the electrons from the double bond move towards the plus charge because that's empty. In this case, we don't have a plus charge, we have a minus charge. We have a lone pair that's coming down to form the pi bond. You can't push more electrons towards it because it's um, uh, then it would have 10 electrons. So that would come down to form a new double bond. But in order to do that, you have to break a bond. And that pi bond shifts those electrons up onto the oxygen. So the Lewis structure then for the other side, is that big enough? You can see those. Would look like that now with the minus charge on the top oxygen. And to go from the right structure to the left, you would just do it the other way. Push the, a pair of electrons from the top oxygen down to form a new pi bond, and push that up there. Now I'm showing this as if they're interconverting back and forth, and they're not. I want to remind you what's in between is a hybrid of those two extremes. So for acetate, it is a, 
uh, an ion which has two resonance forms. Okay, how about nitrate? Can you draw resonance forms for this, and how many are there? Yeah, there are there are three resonance forms. So if I take a look again, look at the nitrogen in the middle has a formal plus charge, four bonds. We have two oxygens now that have a formal minus charge. I showed nitric acid a few minutes ago. One of these had a proton on it, right? This is just the deprotonated form. Uh, in order to form a pi bond from one of those lone pairs of oxygen, you have to break the pi bond of the adjacent double bond. Okay? So we can draw another resonance form, which looks like this. I'll leave it to you to fill in the other little pairs if you want. Okay, is that the only delocalization? No, the, the electrons that are on the oxygen shown on the left here, these can also delocalize. So that I can draw those come down and break that. And so if we were able to label each of these three oxygens differently, you would be able to see that there would be three different resonance forms for this. So the negative charges in here are actually spread out between all three oxygens. Two negative charges spread out between all three oxygens. Okay. Benzene. Benzene is a conjugated molecule. And we're going to talk a lot in the next chapter, probably starting next week, uh, all about benzene and aromatic compounds. Um, if you think about the structure of benzene or cyclohexatriene, what's known about the structure is that benzene is a very symmetric molecule. Okay? The, the representation that we give to benzene that I've drawn here with a six-membered ring with three double bonds doesn't accurately reflect the structure. First of all, if you were to think about a single bond, the length of a carbon-carbon single bond versus the length of a carbon-carbon double bond, which would you expect to be longer? Single bond, yeah. A double bond actually is a shorter bond. <clears throat> in fact, in benzene, all the bonds, doesn't matter where you look, all the bonds are 1.4 angstroms or 140 picometers. Every single bond is identical. So that tells you that it's not really a double bond between these two carbons and a single bond between these two carbons. What we have actually is something that's like half a double bond between everything. Uh, and we often represent benzene with a circle in the middle showing those electrons are all delocalized throughout, all three double bonds. So you can think about this as a resonance form and to, to think about how those electrons might be changed from the structure on the left to the structure on the right. Imagine the electrons from this double bond sh shifting over to form a double bond between the red there. At that point, of course, you have to break a bond to the carbon it's forming a new bond to, so you have to push that one here and then push that one there. So if you just think about taking all three of those double bonds and they're all shifting one position, you get to the structure on the right. Okay, so actually everything is identical. It's, it's completely symmetric. All the bonds are the same. All the bond lengths are the same. In the bond order, or the double bond, it's like something in between a single bond and a double bond in terms of electron ownership in those pi bonds. Okay, that's going to become very important, particularly when we have conjugation in ring structures. There are very special cases that provide um, some extra stability so reactivities of these are going to be different, and we'll get to that in the next chapter. <clears throat> well, here's a, 
a structure of a, a functional group we call an amide, which is a carbon oxygen double bond adjacent to a nitrogen. This is this happens to be four amide. If you uh, if you have a set of hydrogens on the nitrogen, you have two methyl groups. That's dimethyl formamide or DMF, sometimes used as a uh, an agent to get medicines through your skin. But uh, take a look at the structure I have. I have I have oxygens, I have carbon, I have nitrogen, I have no formal charges. Everything, every atom in here in this structure is neutral. Okay, but are there resonance forms that you could think, imagine? between lo lone pairs, pi electrons, is there conjugation? And the answer is yes. So notice the nitrogen has a lone pair, and that lone pair is delocalized towards the CO double bond. So you should be able to draw resonance forms exactly the same way we did with acetate. It's just now nitrogen's lone pair instead. Take the lone pair of nitrogen, form a double bond there, at the same time it kicks the pi bond electrons from the CO double bond to the oxygen. And that resonance form looks like this. And notice with the formal charges now, with the formal charges, Nitrogen gets a formal plus charge, oxygen has a formal negative charge. Keep in mind, we're starting with a neutral molecule. Uh, plus and minus actually cancel out, so overall the molecule structure on the right is also neutral. Okay, that's another check to make sure you've done, you've done your formal charges right. You have the same charges, overall charge on the left versus the right. And that's a, that's a resonance form for a formamide. Okay. Now, which of those forms would you think would be more stable, lower in energy? The, the one on the left, right. Because if we actually do have to separate and localize charges, which is what the structure on the right does, that's higher in energy. But the structure on the left is not actually the structure. There's some contribution from the structure on the right. So when you think about this functional group, an amide functional group, okay, any in any molecule, if you have CO double bond next to a nitrogen, the oxygen has quite a bit of negative charge on it. The electron density is greater than other kinds of oxygens. Okay, why would that why would that be important? Well, in proteins, in proteins, proteins are polymers or large molecules of amino acids which are all connected by an amide bond. So whatever is the protein here, they're all connected by an amide bond. And the electronic nature of that amide bond and that resonance, especially the electron density on the oxygen and the fact that the hydrogens on the nitrogen are more acidic because there's a plus charge, some plus charge on nitrogen uh, actually helps in doing hydrogen bonding and making protein structures stable. So it's important to understand how the charge distribution is. So you would never think about the nitrogen in this case, even though we draw this nitrogen with a lone pair, it's not negatively charged. If anything, it has a slight positive charge. Okay. Um, all right, let's uh, uh, try and think. Would you like to see a couple more examples of resonance forms? Okay. Let's think about... <clears throat> this. This is a molecule called furan. common name, but that's what we call this, furan. It's a cyclic ring, five-member ring with an oxygen and two double bonds. Can you draw any resonance forms for this? Do you see, are there electrons that are conjugated and delocalized throughout? 
Well, keep in mind, furan, the oxygen, has two lone pairs. So how might you draw another resonance point? Uh, both double bonds on the oxygen. How would you get there? It's hard to get two double bonds onto the oxygen. Then you have four bonds to oxygen, you'd have a two plus formal charge. That would be difficult. But we have one lone pair which could delocalize. So if you think about, let's just draw this. Let's just take this electron pair on the, on the oxygen, make a new double bond. When you do that, you have to break one of the bonds to, to that carbon, the, the double bond, pi bond. So we'll take the electrons from that and just shift it up onto the carbon as a lone pair. That's a valid resonance form. Okay. Now again, we have atoms which have the number of electrons and bonds aren't what would be for the valency, so this oxygen will, is going to have a plus. I'll go the lone pair too on oxygen. The oxygen is going to have a plus formal charge. The carbon is going to have a minus formal charge. Okay. Any other resonance forms available? So the other lone pair, yeah, so we could, the other lone pair could do it the other way. I'll just draw it on there. Um, that would be this structure. Okay. Is that the same or is that different? Yeah, question? Um, yeah, why wouldn't um, the, lone, the double bond shift like it does in benzene rather than make a lone uh, good question. The question is, why did I put the lone pair on the carbon and not uh, shift the double bond over and break the next double bond? Well, for a very good reason that that certainly is one of the resonance forms, and I want to get there from this one. So if you take this and do that, then you have to shift that up onto that carbon. Okay? So yes, you could do that. You could write both of those arrows, and that gets you to another resonance form, which looks like this. Okay. The problem is you can't then shift that um, lone pair down to the oxygen because the oxygen already has eight electrons. You'd have to break some. So to make two double bonds to the oxygen would be not possible. You have to break it if you make one of the others. Okay. Actually, these two are identical. I shouldn't use a resonance arrow. I should use a well, resonance arrow is fine. They're equal. They're identical. I've just flipped it over, right? So furan, actually we can draw three valid residence forms for this. That show that the negative charge exists on carbons throughout the ring and oxygen has a slight positive charge. Now, of course, I can draw these residence forms, but actually this one is the most stable one. It best represents the structure as closest to that. Uh, but there are contributions, and so when we think about where an, uh, a nucleophile or an electrophile might interact with furan, then we have some ideas based on the resonance structures where charges are. It helps us predict things. Uh, let's see. Let me think of another good example. This, well, this anion. I have a lone pair on a carbon. Can you draw a resonance form for that? And how many are there? Yeah, 
I won't have to break the oxygen double bond, so we could go this way. Okay. You'd have to push those electrons up on oxygen, in which case we would have a structure now with three lone pairs on oxygen and a minus charge there. Look, I've created a benzene ring. Well, what else could that do? I could have drawn this the other way, right, and pushed it up there first. There's a valid resonance form. I could keep going, push that up over here. Okay, that has the same same structure as the one on the left. I can keep going, push that up there. Guess what? <laughs> we just made a loop. Actually, the electrons are flowing all the way around throughout this. Um, if you recall, when we were talking about acidity, I told you the pKa of this is somewhere less than 5. The pKa of phenol. And the pKa of methanol, for example, is 16. 15 and a half, something like that. Why is this one on the left much more stable? Because if you take the proton off, you get a phenoxide ion, anion, and that then can spread out the negative charge through resonance. It's more stable than having the, res the meth methoxide ion where the negative charge is in one place. Okay, so that's the explanation of why this one is so much more acidic than methanol, because the anion is so much more stable. Okay. So these concepts all connect. That's one of, the, one of the things about organic chemistry is you're learning all these different concepts, but they're all connected to explaining and understanding reactions and reactivity. Okay, so that's resonance. There are a number of um, uh, problems, I think, in the homework uh, that cover resonance, which you should really go through. Uh, I want to talk a little bit more about pi systems and alkynes and how that's similar and a little bit different than reactions we've talked about for alkenes. So recall the structure of alkynes. They are carbon-carbon triple bonds. Uh, and carbon-carbon triple bonds can be located in many places throughout uh, the chain. They could be on the end of a chain. They could be in the middle of a chain. Uh, we talked earlier about how to name them. Uh, so recall what we've discussed about the structure. <clears throat> Alkynes have two pi bonds, which are orthogonal. That is, they're 90 degree degrees apart in orientation. Related to an alkene, you can see that they also are electron rich. They, be, they react with electrophiles, things positively charged. They will react with very similarly to how an alkene <coughs> reacts with. Okay? So the difference is we have two pi bonds instead of just one. And that's really one of the, the main differences which you should be able to think about when you think about reactions of alkynes. They are going to be very, very similar to alkenes. Okay. So when we do a reaction like we talked about on Tuesday, hydrogenation of a double bond with hydrogen and a palladium catalyst, we add two hydrogens across the pi bond, but since we have a second pi bond, we add it a second time. So one of the things that characterizes reactions of alkynes is that we do a lot of the same chemistry we do with alkenes, it just happens twice. So instead of adding two hydrogens, we add four hydrogens and end up again with a saturated hydrocarbon that's an alkane. Okay? Because if, it, because you know, if we were to generate the alkene, an alkene will react under hydrogenation conditions, right? So it's hard to stop. This catalyst actually, this particular catalyst, palladium carbon, is very reactive. So it, it reacts not only with the alkyne, but we can get an reaction with alkene, and it goes all the way, adding 
two equivalents of hydrogen. Okay, and that, but as a chemist wanting to have the tools to be able to control it the way I want, I want to be able to stop that reaction in the middle. Okay, so how would I think about doing that? I will say alkynes generally are more reactive initially than alkenes. They'll react faster than an alkene initially. So the triple bond is more reactive than the double bond, and the double bond more reactive, of course, than single bonds. So if I want to think about stopping the reaction in the middle at the alkene stage, what I want to do is to, to figure out if I can find a catalyst which is reactive enough to react with the triple bond, but isn't so reactive that the double bond will continue to react. You want something in, in between reactivity. Uh, and that can be done. And so uh, this is a, a little bit complicated. The only thing I want you to remember is that when you see something called Lindlar's catalyst, it's something that's a less reactive catalyst. Actually, it's a palladium catalyst, which is slightly uh, poisoned or reactivity tamed by other additives. But it's a catalyst which allows us to add hydrogen and stop at the alkene stage. It doesn't react with alkenes, only alkenes. So by choosing uh, the right catalyst, we can do the exact same reaction but stop at different points. So that's a reaction to put into your reaction memory bank. Um, hydrogen with a palladium on carbon catalyst will react very reactive all the way to the alkane. Lindlar's catalyst will stop halfway at the oxygen stage. And it does provide the cis double bond because it's adding in the same way. We talked about the hydrogen adding with a catalyst. It's adding both hydrogens on the same side. So we can control not only the reactivity, but it also gives us a very selective product. It gives us a cis alkene, not a trans alkene. Cool, huh? Well, what about HBr? We add HBr to alkenes, we can add them to alkynes. If you can very carefully control the reaction and add only one equivalent, what you would get would be addition of HBr to form a bromoalkene. That's often difficult to do. So with excess amounts of HBr, you'll get two additions. You'll get an addition to the alkyne, and then a second addition of HBr to the alkene product of that. And notice the Markovnikov selectivity. In this case, it's in the middle of a, uh, a chain. So the triple bond, it could have added in either direction. Uh, if it were on the end, the hydrogen would add on what carbon? It would add to the most hydrogens, one on the end. Uh, but notice, importantly, once we put one HBr on, now we have a double bond with different substitutions on each end, and the bromine also counts as a substituent to help stabilize plus charge. So the second HBr adds in a Markovnikov selectivity, giving the bromine on the same carbon that the other bromine was. Okay, so we, we get that product selectively, and that's something to be aware of. We do get Markovnikov selectivity in that reaction. Same thing with Br2. Bromine, if we if it's it's difficult, but in some cases it may be possible to very carefully add only one equivalent. But the alkene is still reactive, and so just like having HBr, adding Br2 can add twice. And in this case, we're adding a Br on either end of the pi bond, both in the first step, and then with the alkene, we're adding a Br on either end of that alkene. Okay, so we end up with four bromines in the product. What about hydration? We, we saw that we could add in alkenes, it's a little bit uh, slightly different, but the similar concept. If you take an alkene and add H3O plus, or water with an acid catalyst, okay, we add the proton first, so the proton adds there, and then we get the plus charge. Then the OH 
uh, H2O adds to that, right? You get that and then you lose the acid catalyst comes off again to regenerate and you get the alcohol add on the table. Right. That's what we learned for alkenes. Okay. Well with alkynes, the same thing happens. We add uh, hydrogen H plus to the alkyne to the less substituted side, that would be the N. Okay, so that's what we get in this intermediate. Uh, the difference is that this is a product which is not very stable. It actually undergoes what we refer to as a tautomerization or a, a rearrangement, where the proton from the oxygen shifts to the carbon and the double bond shifts to the oxygen. So if you think about, let me just draw this out a little bit carefully for you. Okay. If we think about this structure, what happens is, um, imagine a resonance form where we take a lone pair of the oxygen and shift it to the carbon. Okay. Notice now we have a proton on the oxygen, the oxygen has a double bond, and the carbon has a negative charge. So guess what happens? This negative charge will pick up these acidic protons, and that actually ends up there. So that's how the reaction works. Uh, uh, one way to try to remember this reaction, I think, is if you think about alkynes reacting twice, where alkenes react only once, so we've reacted to add water to make not one bond to oxygen, but two bonds to oxygen. Okay, that's one way to think about how that reaction works. And okay, that can help you remember, perhaps. This is a structural functional group which we refer to as a ketone. A carbon-oxygen double bond with two other alkyl groups on it, a ketone. Okay, so that's, uh, the details here to help you understand it. I'm not going to ask you this mechanism, but if you do know it, it can always help you predict it. Another way to do that is to use a mercury catalyst. So I think your book might have had this combined with mercuric sulfate. It's just the difference is instead of an H plus, it's using a mercury to catalyze the reaction instead of acid. Uh, reaction is exactly the same, except that this is replaced with proton later. That's all. So you might see that. So don't be confused if you see HgSO4. Think about it like a proton catalyst for hydration. Okay, one of the differences, so those are all very similar reactions to alkenes, right? Uh, one of the very fundamental important differences between alkynes and alkenes is that the hydrogens on an alkyne carbon, on an sp hybridized carbon, is more acidic than an alkene or an alkane. And you can see here I have uh, ethane, ethene, and ethine, and I've listed the pKa values for the hydrogens on those. Okay, pKa of 62 for an alkane, somewhere around there. You, you, there's not a base known that could be protonate an alkane. And the pKa is just way too high. As a matter of fact, we usually use carbanions generated a different way as bases to deprotonate something else. Alkene, also extremely high pKa. Remember, to give you some context, water has a pKa of 15, somewhere around 15. Uh, most acids that we talk about relative to water are lower than that. Alcohols are, many alcohols are just slightly higher than water. These are extremely high. But an alkyne, alkyne has a pKa of 26. It's possible to find bases which allow us to deprotonate an alkyne. So we can actually generate 
a carbanion easily from alkynes. And once we have a carbanion, we can use this as a nucleophile to react with other things. All right. So remember, if we have like a carbocation, bromide adds. Well, if we have some other functional group with partially positive charge, we can use this as a nucleophile. Now here, here it shows you some examples of acid-base reactions to demonstrate what we use to deprotonate an alkyne. An alkyne obviously has a pKa too high for water to deprotonate because the protonated water, the conjugate acid, is much, much lower pKa, right? Much, much lower. If, if you were to use the water as a base to make this conjugate acid, the risk reaction would lie far on the left. Okay? And if you use sodium hydroxide and you had the hydroxide ion, even then if you do this reaction, acid-base reaction to deprotonate alkyne with a pK of 26, you generate water as the conjugate acid, and the pKa is 16, 15.7, right? That reaction is going to lie far on the left. Uh, but if we use a nitrogen base, like you take ammonia and deprotonate it, you have this um, uh, amide anion, that is strong enough of a base to deprotonate and shift this equilibrium to the right side. You can take that proton off, generate the carbon ion, and now we have the product generated that's ammonia. That's the conjugate acid in this reaction. Notice the pKa is 10 pKa units higher than the alkyne. So that's a suitable base to be able to generate and deprotonate and make these alkynes, or these alkyne anions. So we can do things like this. We use a strong base like sodium amide, generate an alkyne anion, and that alkyne anion can react with other organic functional groups like alkyl halides. So if you recall, before we talked about carbon-halogen bonds as being polarized, right? Difference in electronegativity. So a carbon of a carbon-bromine bond has partially plus charge, and a bromide, the bromine end has a partially negative charge. That bond in between can be broken. So if you think about this acetylide ion as a nucleophile, it attacks the positively charged carbon, kicking off the bromine. Okay. Now we form a new product. And for the first time in this class, this is a, a reaction which generates a new carbon-carbon bond. Okay. We've taken two organic molecules and we've connected them together. That's a pretty fundamental difference from everything else we've talked about. We've added bromine, we've added water, we've reduced, we've added hydrogen, we've oxidized. But this is the first time we've been able to combine carbon skeletons to make it bigger. Right? And that's one of the main goals we have when, we want, when we're trying to do organic synthesis and build molecules. We want tools like this to be able to synthesize new carbon structures. Okay? That's why we spent some time talking about additions of HBr, additions of Br2. That allows us to generate things which we can react with nucleophiles to make new carbon structures. So this bond right here between that carbon and that carbon, that's a very synthetically useful bond and a useful transfer. So these are very, very valuable intermediates. These carbon ions from acetylenes or from alkynes. Uh, these are extremely useful to be able to do all kinds of synthesis with. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more next time.